All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is RFI Diggity. Uh, I'm Fran Brown. I'm a uh, partner at Bishop Fox, a security firm that uh, helps companies secure their networks and applications. Uh, I got some pretty fun stuff for you here today. Um, I was just mixing it up at the end there a little bit uh, and adding some of the newer slides uh, to the beginning, just to front load a little bit, because I realized in uh, looking at the abstract, I kind of took on a lot of things. So just in case we don't get to everything, uh, we'll at least go over some of the new stuff as well. New. Okay, so I got some bad news and good news, but the good news trumps the bad news, so it's okay. Um, for those of you that uh, noticed in the uh, abstract that it said that it would be giving out 100 uh, circuit boards for the new uh, backdoor version of the Tastic RFID Thief, I didn't get it in in time to get it printed for this, but it's probably for the best. I don't know how many of you guys were here when we did it uh, two years ago, but it was basically like a madhouse. Like I think like three people got stabbed, like crawling over each other. One woman gave birth. It was just like pandemonium, like people crawling to get to the circuit board. So that's for the better. But the good news that trumps that, um, if you stick around to the end, at the very end, and remind me because I don't say it, uh, I'm gonna throw up an email uh, and the first 100 people that email me uh, with uh, their physical address, I will mail the circuit boards once they come into them. Um, and I'll send you random letters as well, love letters and you know, things like that. If you, you know, it's risk versus reward, so um, I will, but you have to stick around to the end. So uh, the first 100 you know, items in my inbox will get one mailed out to them uh, pretty soon. Um, but uh, just, I'm gonna go over kind of uh, a little bit of logical order some of these. <coughs> RFID issues, but in the, in the beginning here, just to kick things off, I kind of want to highlight a few of the newer tools. Um, so with this talk, what I want to do is, um, in doing research for this, to do practical penetration tests, and uh, I've always had the issue of you have to read, you know, like a hundred things before you get to the answer that you want. So this is a, to be the best of tools and techniques and what you need to know as a pen tester um, for doing RFID hacking. In this case, uh, HF and UHF. Um, and there's a few new tools as well, uh, in addition to some of the best in the breed. So um, I mentioned that uh, I was creating a, uh, and it's getting pretty popular right now, I saw uh, at Black Hat, the guys uh, released the BLE key. Are you guys in here? Guys that did the BLE key? Yeah? Oh yeah? All right, cool. So yeah, so it's something similar to that, and we've seen some things before as well, but basically uh, weaponizing the Tastic uh, circuit board to be a man in the middle device that instead of weaponizing a reader as we, how many people are, have seen my last talk? I'm, I'm assuming a lot, or if you're in here that you're interested in RFID. Um, so basically I created the circuit board to weaponize a reader and it just reads the reader standard input. Um, and I realized afterwards that, hey, you can make it actually as a backdoor device as well. Um, and instead of putting it in your own reader, you creep up it three in the morning to the building that you're trying to break into and pop the lid off a reader and plant it in there instead and close it and it's, uh, it can capture badge values uh, as they get them um, by you know, just actually tapping into the wires. So I was like, okay, I have, the, I have basically what I need already. Like this goes into a reader, this reads it, this tastic circuit board. If only I could make it smaller and you know, maybe hook up Bluetooth to it or something like that. Um, and I was like, Oh, uh, we shrunk, or, or how many of you guys are familiar with RF Duino? I was looking, I was like, uh, let me see, They're like we shrunk the Arduino and we added Bluetooth capability. I was like, that is exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, <laughs> awesome, uh, that made it a lot easier. Um, so I'll be releasing uh, the schematics, um, basically a much stripped down version just using this RF Duino uh, without the uh, SD card to make it small and that you can plan into any reader. Um, quickly going through a few other things that are new. I'll get into more detail on them. We were just in a blog post on this, but uh, as, we'll, as we'll see, some of the traditional uh, RFID hacking techniques involve trying to, uh, you know, secretly walk by somebody and steal their badge information, make a fake copy of their badge, and then break into a building. Um, uh, some of the newer uh, technologies uh, for RFID, physical security anyway, uh, like iClass, there have been some flaws in them that allowed uh, people to continue this type of attack. Uh, but eventually, we have to imagine people are going to get their act together 
Um, and eventually, it'll be no longer a viable target to go into Starbucks and walk by somebody and steal their badge, in which case we're going to have to start attacking the readers uh, and the controllers uh, directly, which is we just saw the readers. And um, basically, we're just coming up with a, a few queries here. In Shodan, um, I found a, I literally just put in three queries that uh, just sticking around with it and found uh, a few hundred uh, controllers exposed to the internet. Um, and basically, if you guys are familiar with these controllers at all, if you have network connection to them at all, it's game over. Um, there's basically, uh, they have uh, default credentials that they can't change of root and pass, uh, username. Or, and if you change it, it actually breaks the product. Uh, so if you have network connectivity at all to any of these controllers, you basically own their physical security system. Uh, and they're not supposed to be hooked up to the internet. Uh, but uh, it seems like quite a, quite a few people have, uh, especially a lot of universities. So you can you know, basically start closing and open the doors and, and things like that over the internet there um, with just a handful of Shodan queries. Or how many of you guys have seen any of my uh, uh, Google hacking, Google diggity research before? Only a few people? Okay, the, the origins of the diggity. Uh, uh, name. Basically, this is a search diggity, and, and one of the tools in it is Shodan diggity, which allows you to just hook up in, uh, to the API for Shodan and quickly do some queries. So we see a few of them here. No, you can't really see me. Uh, one other thing I should uh, mention is that basically my slide decks are like the notes sections, they're like white papers. So uh, if you ever want to follow up on any of these things, if you download the slides, the notes sections have links to every resource and uh, well documented. Um, I tried to uh, cite most people for their tools in, actually in the slide, but uh, at the very least, um, the, if you guys are looking to follow up on this stuff, the uh, notes of the slides are a great, great resource for that. Um, uh, so using that, I uh, just ran it. And uh, basically, th these guys have uh, Telnet and um, FTP, and, uh, and they have a nice web interface open uh, for, I believe this was for a college dorm. Um, but basically, I mean, this took me all of two seconds to, to put this together and uh, uh, quickly found them in Shodan and just by browsing to them. If you actually uh, mouse over any of the doors, it gives you a pop-up of the last valid badge value, <laughs> which you can see there that, that logged in. So I mean, it's not really necessary anyway because you can just open the doors uh, from this interface, but uh, it's, it's just one of those things where um, it never ceases to amaze me what uh, people hook up to the internet um, and what you can get access to. So that is in the controllers. Um, and I uh, came up with a few scripts um, that were based on uh, uh, Brad. Uh, I'd never heard him pronounce his last name. Is Brad in here from McAfee? Does RFID hacking? And Tanovich and Tanovix? Yeah. I'd butcher his last name. But basically, uh, Brad, and, well, when I get into it, uh, you'll see some links to his research, has, has done a lot with attacking readers and controllers. And he had one script that uh, went out and can query them and get the exact version of the controllers and one at a time. And um, I'll be releasing on our GitHub uh, a few uh, random uh, RFID hacking scripts for things like that. Um, so being able to feed a list of a couple hundred IPs uh, to the script, and it can go out and uh, actually query it and figure out what kind of controller it is, what's its version. Uh, and things like that. These are just some of the stats from me just messing around for like uh, an hour. So, um, so that's a, a quick preview on the uh, reader and controller front. But getting back to the uh, the traditional uh, type of attacks um, that we uh, covered in the last uh, talk with the low frequency RFID hacking. Uh, you get to our base methodology, which is still extremely effective of um, if you want to break into a building, if you're looking at uh, physical security systems that are RFID based, you got three simple steps of first, you want to steal somebody's badge information, second, you want to create a copy of it, and then third, you go and break in and uh, to minimize the amount of time that you are a trespasser, uh, you want to plan a back door so that you can get out as quickly as possible uh, and maintain your presence. Um, and uh, we, we've seen before, uh, I hope that for the low frequency, the hit procs and the dollar proc stuff, some of you guys might have seen this, uh, but this is the I-Class R90 long range reader. 
um, which without any modification at all, if you already have a, uh, a TASTIC RFID thief circuit board, you could just hook it right up to um, this uh, I-Class long range reader and still accomplish that type of attack for, uh, for most people out there. Um, and cloning, and I'll get into a little more details about it, but there's a number of cloners that have come out uh, uh, based on some of the vulnerabilities in iClass, and the quickest and easiest that I've come across is the one that you buy from China. Um, uh, <laughs> it's funny, uh, in, in trying to buy, I mean, this is like by far the easiest, like just point and click making clone copies of, of high frequency iClass uh, cards. Um, but uh, he's like, you have to do a, a bank transfer to China and had all these requirements and stuff like that, um, which could turn some of you guys off to wanting to do it. Uh, I was getting some weird looks in the office when I was like, yeah, so yeah, how do I transfer to, to China this, this amount? And you know, people's ears were perking up. Uh, but I ended up just sending the guy the money via PayPal, even though he didn't say that was an option, and he sent me the thing anyway. So FYI, if that was what was stopping you, um, just send it to him via PayPal, uh, and I'll hook you up with it. Um, uh, so, yeah, so we got the step one, steal uh, the badge information for a high frequency system. Step two, make a clone copy of an iClass card. And step three, and I'll be releasing this on our Thingiverse uh, page. How many of you guys are familiar with the Pwn plug? I would imagine most people. How many of you are familiar with the Power Pwn version? Uh, so, the Power Pwn version is like a um, uh, like a power strip instead of just a plug, and it costs like a couple grand, and I think it's discontinued now, um, but it's pretty awesome. Uh, but even when you can get it, it's like two grand. So uh, I finished uh, the designs, and, and they'll be out there. My printer uh, broke after printing the, the bottom half. It's gonna be two halves, but basically, uh, I created the 3D prints, uh, top and bottom half, to uh, create a custom case for a Raspberry Pi that's like the Power Pwn. So you can buy a thirty-five dollar Raspberry Pi, print out the two halves of uh, this three uh, D file that y'all throw up on Thingiverse, um, and we have that's our Bishop Fox Thingiverse, and uh, go down to Home Depot and just grab a standard like uh, plug, and you're gonna have a two thousand dollar power pwn for you know like forty bucks. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so that should be uh, up. And most of the stuff, I, most of the stuff will either be up later today on our various sites, or uh, by the end of tomorrow at the very latest. So either our go to our main website. Um, all the stuff's always free. Um, all, all of our tools, our resources are all free. Uh, the website's the best place to go, and that'll link you to either our GitHub or our Thingiverse for 3D prints. Um, you know, our YouTube for uh, tutorial videos and stuff like that. So you got. Step one, two, and three for a high frequency uh, system. How many of you guys have been watching Mr. Robot? It's, it's freaking awesome, right? Um, it's unbelievably awesome. How many of you guys saw the episode where he used the Tastic RFID thief? Uh, basically, if you look at their plan for taking down Evil Corp, uh, it was three steps uh, that they basically had. Um, and I figured I could show you guys, I got a couple videos here. So first, just a quick, uh, to see what it looks like stealing. So just an I-Class card, and just with the normal Tastic RFID circuit board, uh, it goes ahead and grabs it and stores it and gives you everything that you need. Um, I don't know if you, you'd see it there, I'll blow it up later, I don't have time. But basically, it's card number 14569. So, I mean, pretty simple, and then you just go make a, a fake copy of the card, right? It's not that impressive. I mean, it is, but it's not as impressive as, say, Christian Slater doing it. <laughs> like, my mom and dad get it now. They're like, oh, that's what you were talking about. Like, never watched any of my Black Hat or DEF CON talks, but, like, Christian Slater just got their attention on USA. Uh, so, yeah, I could have put together a demonstration video, but they did it for me. So step one, go into Starbucks. Walk by somebody with your tastic RFID thief. 
either a weaponized version of the I-Class or Hiprox or, or whatever uh, technology. I pay my respects. Thank Christian you. Slater's not even slick at all doing this sorry, either. Sorry. He's like, I just want to pay my compliments. Hey, excellent coffee, fantastic service. Buy yourself something nice. Step two. Make a clone version of the card. Steel Mountain. We're trying to penetrate a data security facility whose tagline literally is. You're going to ask to speak to a soup. And then step three. Provisor Wendy. She'll get us to exactly where we need to be. Then we'll be able to get rid of her from the van. After that, you connect a Raspberry Pi to the climate control system and Bob's your uncle. So basically the plan for taking down Evil Corp was the, the step one, step two, step three uh, from the last dog, which is pretty awesome. Um, but it, it's simple, but it's, it's pretty effective. Um, in case you don't want to, I mean, they're not too slick. Uh, I think he's got caught a couple times doing stuff. Um, if you don't want to sit there and try to pull together uh, and pull out of the wall somebody's uh, thermostat and mess with it, basically, instead of doing that, this is just your easy way of Uh, this is just be your easy way to go ahead and drop something instead of trying to pull the whole wall apart. But basically, the end result is the same: trying to plant a Raspberry Pi uh, as a permanent presence on their uh, internal network. Cool. So this is a quick, uh, quick brief over some of the newer uh, things that we are releasing or just released. Um, okay. So far. So what am I talking about here? In the, um, in the talk I gave in 2013, that strictly just focused on low frequency RFID hacking. And it's always great when one of these articles come out and it's uh, for a, uh, getting long distance on the low frequency is, 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 is pretty hard to do. Um, you can only get a couple feet uh, and uh, most people want to um, you know, post links to, that's, that's not a big deal at all. Here's an antenna and it's an antenna for like UHF or, or something completely different. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings and, and a lot of myths and a lot of uh, room for confusion when it comes to RFID hacking. Uh, in fact, I mean, you know, I, I was pretty dedicated and it, it took me a while to get to the most basic answers that I would want for myself um, for most of these things. So I could understand most people's confusion when it comes down to it. And basically you're looking at three major branches of RFID. We covered the low frequency before, which is mainly physical security systems, um, and it's the completely grossly insecure uh, stuff that most people still today use, and if you have an RFID card on you, which it probably is. Um, but with this talk, I wanted to extend into um, the high frequency and ultra high frequency aspects of it, both the newer physical security systems that use uh, high frequency, as well as various other things that are basically blowing up all over the place. Um, just some examples. RFID is in everything. It's kind of scary. I mean, it's, it's all over the place now um, with the Internet of Things and everything's connected. Basically, everybody's talking to everybody. Um, so from your credit cards to your, you know, your Disney Fast Passes to your green cards to your passports to some people are just putting them in their hand to open doors like they're Darth Vader or something. Um, who would put, I, I don't know who would do that. I mean, it looks cool, but that's got to be, yeah. Uh, to uh, hospitals, or especially, um, which is kind of scary. Uh, to uh, I just noticed on the in the airport on the way on the way here. I mean, the just the vending machines are all RFID based. Um, uh, mobile payment systems are, are NFC, and NFC is basically high frequency, uh, same frequency as high frequency. 
Um, I'm even seeing like weird things. Uh, uh, somebody in my company found a, a, a secure hard drive, which you see there uh, in this, the top row, second from the left, uh, that uh, basically to utilize the external hard drive, you have to have an RFID badge uh, near it for it to unlock it. Um, so you're starting to see all kinds of weird applications. Uh, enhanced driver's licenses. How many people's hotel room key while they were in Vegas was RFID? Uh, you're starting to see more and more uh, have them, especially in Vegas. Um, but I, I imagine in a couple years from now, uh, most hotel keys are going to be RFID based. So um, these types of attacks are uh, only becoming more and more useful. So this is a basic physical security uh, set up in terms of how things flow. Whether it's credit cards or somebody's physical security system or your Coke rewards. Uh, how many people use Coke rewards? Or my Coke rewards now? Any? Nobody? Pe Pepsi crowd, huh? <laughs> All right. Beer. Good to know. Uh, uh, but basically what we're looking at, somebody's carrying around something with them, whether it's their phone or a badge or a tag or their Obi-Wan Kenobi hand implant, um, and it can uh, talk to a reader of some kind. And the type of attacks are going to be similar, um, just different approaches. So we might want to walk by somebody and skim it off them without their knowing, like Christian Slater did, you know, with his uh, backpack, and then, make a, and then make a copy of theirs. Uh, we might want to do things like directly attack the readers or controllers and not even worry about getting a, a valid badge at all, but just go right to the source. Um, we want to do things like uh, make fake copies of badges, have devices that can emulate uh, badges themselves so you don't have to make a fake copy. It can pretend to be a uh, type of technology. Um, you have uh, some pretty interesting things like, um, like uh, relay attacks, uh, which we see in which case if uh, as things start to escalate and more RFID-based systems are uh, doing um, mutual authentication and things like that, you basically have the circumstance of you got two guys involved in it, uh, one guy standing at the door or the payment system or whatever uh, with, with his uh, device and another guy's following you, uh, behind you, and basically it just starts passing the information back and forth, relaying it, so relay attacks. Um, uh, and we're starting to see more and more of these things as, as people are locking down uh, the badge, the actual badges, whether they have, we're going to see some pretty fly gear uh, when we get to the defensive section here at the end, like uh, RFID blocking skinny jeans, um, which are getting popular. And who, how many, who here has RFID blocking skinny jeans? Yeah. They're coming. They're, yeah. Your kids are going to love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, as, but as people start to do stuff like that and the badge gets uh, harder to copy and clone and steal, then people are going to start moving along to these different types of attacks. Um, uh, maybe we can't steal a badge. Can we brute force badges? Can we guess? If we know one badge number, can we guess the next values? Can we predict? If I bought one Disney ticket uh, that was an RFID badge, can I predict what the next three sold are? Can you predict values? So, I mean, no matter what these, the uses are getting uh, diverse and crazy, but the, the types of thought process and things that you want to do to them or, you know, how you'll come about attacking them are pretty much uh, the same across the board. So, um, I'll, as I get into a few attack types, I'll, I'll show some other gear, but I'd like to basically give you the gist of, for each type of technology, what are the main types of attacks you'd want to try, the things you'd want to perform, and what are the main tools that you'd want to use? Because uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of noise out there. Um, and I, I basically brought this up uh, in my last talk. For years, um, due, due to good reasons, um, at, during uh, kind of the heyday of RFID hacking, um, you could read a million articles about certain tools and uh, this tool did this and all these things and you find 100 articles about something that doesn't exist. And it never got released. All there is is a photo of it on the internet. Uh, and you're trying to find an actual, you're trying to do a penetration test, you're trying to find an actual tool that can help you right now, and you got to like, you know, the first 500 Google hits are all to uh, referring to a tool that doesn't, that was never publicly released. Um, so it's a lot to sort through. Um, these are some of the ones I covered before. Uh, you got the custom 
uh, long range readers. So taking that circuit board and plugging it into uh, a long range reader for either HID procs or Indala procs or iClass, which we just saw there. Um, you got programmable cards. Um, these are some of the ones I covered in my last talk, so I don't want to go over them too much. Uh, uh, some of the stuff that works with the RF idiot scripts, the uh, the the RFIDs uh, stuff in the middle there. Those things are great. Most people aren't aware of those. They're not really a security tool. They are uh, a troubleshooting tool for uh, engineers in the field for RFID stuff. But it's just two USB sticks, um, one high frequency, one low frequency. That if you have a card that doesn't have any physical uh, indications as to what type of technology it is. You don't know what type of card it is. Um, you could use these things to uh, quickly find out what type of card something is, um, which is extremely useful. Um, so getting into the high frequency stuff, some of the, the must have tools. Um, does it look a little blurry? Yeah, anybody? A little blurry? Oh. Um, so uh, some of the stuff you'll want to have in your toolkit are one, um, how many people have the Proxmark? Uh, three, Proxmark's like one of the main tools that you get, but basically making sure that you have the high frequency antenna uh, to be to use that for some of its uh, tools. Um, the one on the bottom left there, this, uh, this is basically like your uh, Swiss army knife of uh, high frequency hacking. Um, there, uh, for using that iClass cloner that I, I referenced there, that works with this reader. Um, you could use this reader to read credit cards. You could use this reader for all sorts of things. People have got it working with Kali, uh, Linux, and it's kind of like your, your number one tool to interact with almost every type of high frequency card. Um, and in the uh, top right there, you got a nice little USB stick that works with libNFC. If you're going to do some NFC hacking, there's not a lot of uh, hardware that actually works with it. So if you want to use some libNFC tools, uh, that little USB stick is, is a good one. Um, we've seen in the last like year or two, there's been an explosion of uh, great mobile uh, platforms for, for doing penetration testing. How many people here have done like a wireless pen test before where you had to like carry around the big laptop and like the big... Yagi and you know you're walking around like this and you know it's until that was like until like three years ago that was like still you know pretty much the uh, the standard you know and people are like what are you looking for yeah nobody uh, like it's a nerd detector yeah but it's been great in the last couple of years you've seen the uh, the Pony Express through the Pony Plug released uh, the Pony Pad which is an Android Nexus Seven. Uh, with their uh, custom image already on it with a lot of pen testing tools, including some uh, RFID hacking tools, wireless tools, Bluetooth tools. Um, even more recent, and I think even less people probably know, how many of you guys have heard of Cali's Net Hunter? Decent amount, eh, maybe like 10% of the crowd or something. Uh, it's relatively new, I think it's probably less than a year old. But basically uh, Cali uh, released some images for some various Android tablets that you could just load onto the Nexus 7 or Nexus 10 there. Uh, and it's uh, Kali Linux on an Android uh, phone. So um, it's, things are finally getting good. And, and you can see how this is uh, appealing from a uh, RFID hacking standpoint where you're physically trying to break into a site. You're physically at Starbucks like Christian Slater trying to pull a move um, to have like small portable devices uh, um, that are actually uh, highly functional. This is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good step in the right direction. Um, also, uh, the Proxmark, which I mentioned, uh, there's, a num again, the uh, slides have a number of references to all these blog posts on people that have put this together for, you know, how to uh, run the Proxmark from your Android phone or something like that. So if you're using that to make your fake copies, you could just pull out your phone, connect it, and, uh, you know, it's a little more convenient than carrying around the big laptop. Cool. Um, I mentioned before the Proxmark. Uh, this is just a set of some of the commands in terms of high frequency. Uh, just give you an overview. These things, uh, the Proxmark is like a Swiss Army knife of uh, it can uh, read cards, simulate cards, clone cards, emulate cards. Uh, has a high frequency and low frequency antenna. Basically, it could do anything. Um, its one limitation has always been distance, which is why we came up with the the Tastic RFID thief to be able to steal somebody's badge from. Uh, further away, but that's pretty much one of its only uh, limitations. It can pretty much do everything. Um, this is some of the overview of the, the high frequency commands. Um, the RFID scripts from Adam Laurie, 
uh, always update it. Uh, it's a library of Python scripts for doing various RFID hacking things, and it comes loaded with Kali Linux. So if you want to get up and running really quickly, you could just download the Kali Linux VM uh, image and, and get some hardware that works with it and uh, be up and running extremely quickly. And the readers, which I mentioned, uh, the, RFID, the RFID is tools, uh, which you, know, you could use to scan to figure out, uh, you know, this is my card for work, or this is my card for my uh, parking lot of my apartment, or something like, um, it doesn't have anything on it that will let me know what type of technology it is. You could just use these with no software to uh, figure out what type of technology it is, so that you can then steal it, make a fake copy, and you know, give free parking at your university to all your friends, or, you know, or whatever you want to do. Uh, type of thing. That's what it's good for. So, um, just getting into some of the stuff that we that we covered uh, again with a lot of these things, and especially with the high frequency stuff, um, it's getting harder. The iClass, there was a uh, reader that I showed, but it's again coming back to one of the the biggest limitations is getting distance. Even as people come up with ways of breaking some of these technologies. Um, what we've always seen is, oh my God, this is so broken and makes all the headlines and uh, it ends up being that you have to get within a centimeter or two to actually steal somebody's badge information. Um, it always is kind of glossed over, uh, which is, uh, for those who have seen my talk before, what I refer to it as the ass grabbing method of uh, RFID hacking. Um, you know, that in every, this is from a lot of slides, videos, presentations, like, it's always like, uh, this technology is so broken. Look how easy it is to steal somebody's information. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, okay, yeah, you can actually read it and clone it and all, but you know, distance is always a problem, and it makes it uh, what's really a risk, what's really practical that you need to worry about versus you know, something that is, you know, the, the probably uh, you got if Jonathan West used there, the creator of the Proxmark, and the, the corner is walking around your campus you know, grab assing you, you're gonna catch them. It's not really that big of a risk. Um, so we have these uh, circuit boards uh, that we saw earlier that weaponize uh, existing RFID readers. Um, some of the early problems that, um, the tools that got talked about, there's a million things for, some, some of the main reasons they never got released uh, were due to being uh, threatened with uh, basically patent uh, disputes. Like, oh, you created a reader that reads these cards to steal them, uh, that reads this type of card? Well, we have a patent on a device that reads these cards. You know, you can't create a reader of your own. And that's what kind of uh, stifled a lot of the uh, release of the tools from 2007 to only a couple years ago. Um, so with this, uh, with this circuit board, you're not creating a reader of your own, you're weaponizing an existing reader. Um, you're just tapping into the output of an existing reader. Uh, that's kind of how we got around that and we're able to you know, build tools that are actually practical for, for penetration tests. Um, and what we're seeing here is, uh, you know, basically you could put it, in, it looks like that's, that's my sketch of Christian Slater walking with his backpack. Um, and then basically I designed this thing that just easily plug into any reader to weaponize it and it just taps into the output of the reader of uh, any badge that it reads. Um, what the badge value is, um, and and it's you, I, I created it for only one reader to begin with, but now it plugs in the high frequency readers. It's still applicable, and basically I just changed it now to be a backdoor device uh, that you could plug in and interpret the results um, of readers as well. So, and, and basically uh, the circuit board's still pretty effective, and it just takes in power. Uh, takes in the output of the reader and outputs it to an SD card and, and to the screen. And for the newer version, it just uh, outputs it over Bluetooth to your phone. And what we're looking at here is uh, what it's tapping into, this main Wigan uh, uh, output of any, any reader that reads a badge for the most part when it comes to physical security, takes it, interprets it, and sends it to a controller. Um, like we saw over the internet, all those controllers. Um, and it's just data one and data zero, just green and white wires for sending ones and zeros for badge value. Uh, and that's just what we're tapping into. Um, I mentioned here, now I'm thinking about this, um, uh, HIT Global is the number one, they are like a monopoly of physical security when it comes to RFID. And 
Uh, they basically have like four major product families of RFID that they have. They have too low frequency and too high frequency. Now there's more than this, but for the most part, it's these four major families of technology. Um, and we have uh, Hitprox and Dollaprox for the low frequency and iClass and MyThread Desfire for the high frequency. Basically, they've released long range readers for three out of four of their product families there. So we were able to weaponize three out of four um, and have long range readers and basically could do the Mr. Robot attack for three out of the major four uh, product families of RFID were covered. So that whole long range problem is solved for those three. Um, unfortunately, they don't have a long range uh, commercial uh, MyFair Desfire Reader um, to weaponize. Um, so uh, that's, you know, I have to wait for them to come out with something like that to weaponize it to avoid patent uh, issues. Um, and I showed you guys the RF Duino, uh, which, is, which is awesome. Uh, uh, but um, in terms of extending the functionality of these things, there's a million Bluetooth devices, uh, as well as, I don't know if you guys have seen, uh, Adafruit has probably the smallest, um, uh, the smallest uh, uh, cell phone uh, add-on, basically, uh, that I've seen yet. They're normally pretty bulky. Um, to do basically send you the cards that it finds over, you know, send you a text message with every card that it finds. Um, so as these devices are getting smaller and easier to use, I mean, now you don't have to create it yourself. Like the RF Duino was, hey, let's make a smaller version that has Bluetooth already on it. Um, each week, uh, it's getting easier and easier to just buy something that just works um, for a lot of these types of attacks. Um, again, this is the one that we saw in the uh, beginning. This is the HIT iClass R90 long range reader. Most of these you could buy on eBay for a couple hundred bucks. Um, and uh, just plug and play with the, uh, the circuit board. So basically, getting into high frequency hacking for physical access control systems, you have the the MyFair Desfire and the iClass two product families of high frequency physical security systems for the most part. And there's a lot of research on this, so I won't go into too much, but basically for iClass, uh, the big problem that they had was the security was completely based on um, people not knowing uh, what a certain key value was, keeping a secret value. And somebody was able to dump the firmware of a reader, extract uh, the secret key from it, and then it was just game over. Um, and, and then it just made it possible to do all the same types of attacks uh, that we saw before with the step one and step two and step three, um, uh, just because of that. Um, again, this, uh, um, for like 200 bucks, you can just get an uh, order from xfpga.com, uh, uh, this uh, iClass cloner, um, just send it money over PayPal, even though it doesn't say it, and it's the easiest by far to just point and click, make a copy of an iClass card. This guy's done a lot of work to prevent reverse engineering of his tool. Uh, you know, and he put a lot of restrictions on it. I would say um, it doesn't allow, you can't attach a debugger to it. It doesn't run in a VM by default, which sucks because if you wanted to, um, it has a physical uh, USB dongle for licensing. Um, this guy's pretty hardcore with protecting his, his product. Uh, which if you have, you know, if, you're, if you want to share it with people in your company, you don't have to physically pass around a laptop with you know, this cloner on it or ship it out to somebody if you're doing a pen test. Um, it's kind of a problem. Um, but I have in there, uh, there's a couple, uh, there's basically one VMware setting that uh, you could set uh, to get around the being able to do it in a VM. Oh, and it's, oh, it's, the thing that killed me is it's, it has to be for, uh, it's using an older version of software and, it has, and it's 32 bit and it won't run on Windows 64 bit and it won't run on a VM either. So I had to go physically get a different laptop to be able to use the tool um, because I had to get a 32 bit system uh, until I figured out there's just one setting of VMware to get around it, um, which are in my notes. So if you guys buy this and um, just, you know, you can check it out so you can run it in VM. And it's kind of funny that he went to all that trouble because actually all it is is, um, basically an older version of uh, HID's uh, uh, contactless demo application that came with their API, um, an older version of it. Uh, he basically just copied that, this, this demo code um, from HID Global um, and then just altered it. And if you just, I mean, if you just looked at his executable, it still said contactless demo uh, VC.exe and his 
um, actual in his actual executable. So he basically just copied it anyway off somebody else. So I don't feel so bad about breaking his VMware thing now. <laughs> the guy from XFPGA, you're not in the, the crowd, are you? Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Um, fingerprint reader. There's some there's some newer stuff now, but uh, that's that's basically just come out. But for the most part, uh, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, if you so uh, the threat is okay. Christian Slater's walking by you in Starbucks, and he picks up your card value. Now that you have everything you need to break into Evil Corp, impenetrable, right? So by adding uh, uh, biometrics and uh, fingerprint and pin, at least I can't walk by you in Starbucks and get everything I need. He, he didn't know what his pin is, if that's what it had. He didn't have his fingerprint yet. Um, so you can't, you know, it, it makes it harder uh, to execute that type of attack, except for the fact, um, this came from Prox Clone. Um, he didn't release tools to do this, but you can basically piece it together from his uh, white paper. Uh, basically, by default, uh, this bio class, the I class biometric stuff, it, uh, it only, it basically, when you put your fingerprint, when you put your finger down, it just validates that your fingerprint that's right on there right now is the same fingerprint that's on the card. So, like, say Christian Slater took that guy's thing and, he, and it came up and it had that, Christian Slater would make a copy with that guy's card value that he stole, but with Christian Slater's fingerprint and Christian Slater's favorite pin number, and it only validates it as the same on the card. So it completely makes it, you know, useless. Um, uh, so if you get one of these readers, you can create your own pin and uh, take your own fingerprint and have those values and then use uh, some of those cloning tools like the XFPGA when you're making a fake copy to write your values for your fingerprint when you're doing it as well. So completely getting by most of that. Um, uh, and this white paper is listed there has the exact values and where you would do that. Although biometrics in general, I mean, uh, is Dan Petro in here? Dan, Dan the man. Dan has a, a lot of like funny things to say about biometrics, but they really shouldn't be used in general when it comes to physical security, things like that. It's like a password that you could never change and that you leave behind on everything that you touch. Uh, you know, you can't revoke it. Like it's like the, it's the worst ever. You can't hash the values of those passwords because you know fingerprints aren't exact. So you, there has to be some fudge factor, and because of that, you can't, you know, you know hash them to somebody. You have to keep them in uh, readable format. They're, they're just terrible in general when it comes to, you know, trying to physically secure something. So reader and controller attacks. So fortunately, uh, those those guys came up with that iClass hack to make some of these traditional attacks against the cards uh, still vi extremely viable. Um, but uh, I gave you guys a preview. Um, uh, that Brad uh, Antanovich that I mentioned, uh, I'll have this thing here in a second. He's come up with some pretty cool tools, um, and I raised a few as well. On uh, if if you know if once your kids all start rocking the RFID blocking skinny jeans, and like you know there's nothing you could do anymore, you know from that attack vector, uh, you have to start going after the actual readers um, and popping the lids off them. People mention this one all the time, the Gecko uh, from uh, Zach Franken and. Um, he basically, unless you're friends with him and he let you borrow it, it's not very much used to you, it never got released. Um, but it was one of the first concepts of this backdoor uh, device uh, to implant and uh, do replays as well. So not only is it recording the values that it sees, but you could walk up with your phone and say, hey, you know, instead of the reader sending the controller a valid badge value, you just send one of the valid badge values you know about to the controller directly and it opens the door for you. So it's like, you know, one of those, you know, uh, smart home locks, but for, you know, you're not supposed to have access to it. You can open up doors without having a badge. Um, so Zach Franken kind of like talked about these and created his own. Um, and I just saw at uh, this uh, past Black Hat, uh, these guys uh, came up with the BLE key, which is uh, basically similar functionality as well. Extremely small. Uh, you could just plant it into a reader at a, at a target facility. It sits there and collects the information. You can come up with Bluetooth and via your phone, dump all the list of values that it's seen so far, as well as open the door um, by replaying some of those values. Did someone say the BLE guys in here? It's pretty cool. Um, so this just came out uh, a couple days ago. Um, you can see how small it is there. Kind of covered these, the Arduino. 
Um, so that's, that's attacking the reader, basically. You're coming up in the middle of the night, you're popping the lid off the reader, you're putting something in there or tampering with it in some way. Um, the reader talks to the controller, which makes all the access decisions. So going after the controller, um, basically that's uh, Brad's, uh, one of his talks that he released these things on his GitHub. And basically um, a number of uh, Arduino uh, tools to basically do brute forcing uh, to the controller. Um, so instead of doing it over the air, like the prox brute, um, going up to the reader, physically plugging in and brute forcing values, which is like five times faster, um, as well as a backed uh, door device of his own. Um, and here's a, a few of them. But basically uh, being able to brute force, do the skimmer, skimmer and emulator, uh, which is similar to the BLE key and uh, things that we mentioned. Um, as well as a number of uh, scripts to, if you have access to it, just open all the doors um, or dump out the cache of the controller um, and all these things. Uh, basically, if you, have any, if you have network access to the controller at all, it's just game over um, for physical security. Uh, there are a number of other tools. He had released some tools for scanning uh, to identify these things um, uh, on the network. How many people here have run f our physical security for a company? Two, three. <laughs> so you guys are just all pen testers. Nobody here is just trying to figure out how to actually defend against these things. Um, so I mean, when you look at these things, most physical security people I know are ex-cops. They didn't come from an IT background. I mean, they're ex-cops. Uh, it's typically things that are uh, products that are purchased outside of the traditional IT purchasing infrastructure. You know, you got you got IT buys and gets licenses for everything except for. Uh, these physical security guys were picking out these technologies and running with them. And almost invariably, uh, even though these networks are not supposed to be hooked up to any corporate network, the physical security networks, um, you shouldn't be able to be sitting in a cube and you know, ping the badge reader at the front door. Um, but these guys are sitting in a shack all night, uh, you know, watching cameras. They want to check out what's going on with their, um, you know, their fantasy football stats. You know, they want to browse the web, like they're sitting in the shack, they're on the network that is the physical network, every single time they end up getting uh, bridged in some way um, because of that. I was like, all I can look at is the camera and the badges, like I'm sitting here in the shack all night, I'm going to check you know, what, my, you know, what my team's doing. So uh, eventually these things, that's how they end up on the internet. That's how like when Shodan, you find a few hundred buildings that are open on the internet, that's how that happens. Um, but, and they're getting easier to find because uh, you have these tools, like this discovery tool that goes out in the network and finds them, they have their own querying language, as well as HID Global was nice enough to go ahead and register um, their MAC address. So basically if you scan a bunch of devices, you can identify any physical security device on the network if it begins with 006, uh, 80, which makes it nice. Um, so as people do these like, uh, you know, mass scanning projects of the internet, um, and, uh, and more and more huge data repositories of every single device on the internet. I am querying them. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to, to go ahead and sort through them to find physical security devices. That's what you're looking for. Um, again, root pass. Uh, if you have access to it, telnet, web, slog them at root pass. It's going to be root pass. They can't change it um, for any of the major ones. Um, Uh, you can, at that point, you can open all the doors, close all the doors, do whatever you want, uh, dump badge values. So this is just some of the, for those of you who hadn't seen the power poem before, this is the power poem, which is a uh, slides old, it was two grand before the end there, uh, which now you get a free version. Um, there's, uh, you can download the Cali Linux uh, Raspberry Pi image as well as uh, Pony Express's Raspberry Pi. There's links to a number of good things here. So basically you just get a Raspberry Pi, download the SD card image for one of these uh, basically poem plug type uh, images and 3D print uh, the files that we'll have up on our site and for like 40 bucks um, you're good to go with your own realistic looking uh, backdoor so you don't have to be like Mr. Robot and pull the wall apart and do all that stuff. And putting together, you guys have seen the Nintastic 3D print, the Nintendo one? Basically it's altered that. But uh, this is like the longest thing I've ever printed. Uh, so I was like, I had to put those like discs on them to keep them from curling up. If you're wondering what those discs are, they just snap off. But when you build something really long, the pressure kind of bows. But it's all taken care of. You just download it and print. What are we doing on time? Cool. 
Ooh, getting close on time here. Um, in uh, doing this kind of stuff, I push these to the end, uh, credit cards, uh, because uh, quite frankly, I mean, the first question any reporter asks for this type of thing is, so tell me about mobile payment systems, tell me about credit cards and RFID. Uh, it's the first question everybody asks. Uh, in all honesty, I mean, they're, they're pretty locked down. It's probably like the least sexy RFID hacking that there is. Uh, there's really not a lot you can do to get over on the credit card companies. Um, and it's interesting, and, and I'm always like, uh, have Google alerts going, and you'll see some news article about critical vulnerability found in Apple Pay. And, uh, you know, and these researchers did this, and then you're reading through it, and you get five paragraphs in. And I just was reading this one, and it was, uh, uh, basically, people set up a rogue wireless access point and redirected their web browser traffic and said, please enter your credit card number. And it was for an iPhone. So they're like, so that's the, that was the, the headline read like Apple Pay, you know, vulnerability, all this stuff, and it, it had nothing to do with it whatsoever. Um, uh, so, and people were kind of stretching for that. Yeah, the credit card companies, there's basically not a lot you could do. Um, um, there's a good blog there. Uh, it's highlighted the actual URL. Uh, from uh, Brad who went through and analyzed what's on your card versus what's on it. Uh, the two best resources are that blog post there as well as uh, Kristen Pageant's uh, talk on uh, credit card uh, fraud. A bit, if you watch, read that one blog post and watch that one talk, it's pretty much, you know, gives you the best, uh, the best overall view of credit card hacking. And um, for the most part, there's things like dynamic uh, CVV. And uh, so if you're, if you're gonna order a pizza, and you put in your credit card number, your name, the expiration date, and your security code. When you're doing RFID, the security code is different every single time. And the credit card companies know what those values are gonna be in order. So if I walked by you and I skimmed your badge value, and you know, I, I, to every transaction, I have to walk by you four times if I wanted to charge to your credit card four times, because I'd have to get the next four security codes. And then if you went and bought pizza or something with RFID before I did that, now you've presented a newer version of it and I go present an old version and they're locked down, like your card just gets locked down. There's like not a lot you could do, so it's not really sexy. Um, passports and, and, and travel documents in general, um, uh, there's a million tools for dumping out all the information on those. What's even scarier really is the ultra high frequency stuff, which are in, so you have passport books and you have passport cards. Uh, and the books are high frequency and the cards are ultra high frequency. Um, and green cards are ultra high frequency, a lot of travel documents, one minute. Um, and basically, they serve no practical purpose except for human behavior, pattern establishment, life, uh, pattern of life establishment, tracking what aisle in Walgreens you went up and went down, where you went throughout the city. Uh, you can track them from miles away. Putting it in your enhanced driver's license, something you can't destroy because it's a federal ID, something you have on your person at all times, they can track wherever you're going. That's the only real purpose that it serves. It's, I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, and it has no security to it whatsoever. I mean, anybody could, it's just a 96 bit uh, value. And we see here, um, this is a tool you could use, pretty cheap to read and clone. They're also using ski passes. We made uh, some copies of my buddy's ski pass. Uh, so you could just put in your helmet and go and you know, go to the ski lodge and that's how they read you. Uh, and it's, it's just, if you can read it at all um, from several miles away, you could just read and copy. And I made a copy of my buddy's green card too, because anyone's looking for green card. Got it, got it. Um, you could, yep, so defenses, you guys could read about uh, these slides later. Uh, here's the, uh, the, the skinny jeans and uh, even blazers now, RFID blocking blazers for the, you know, the business person on the go. Um, but uh, you guys can check out this and uh, thanks everybody. Okay, the email is, are you ready for this? Uh, for the, the tastic backdoor devices, backdoorlover at bishopfox.com, backdoorlover at bishopfox.com, all one word. And go, I'm gonna be writing you guys love letters for the next couple of years as well, but you will also get a circuit board.